Welcome to September. Yeah. I'm so excited to be back. This is fun. Yeah, you've been a lot of places since we last recorded. Oh my god, yeah. I feel like it's just like nice actually being home. Yeah. yeah. Like, how many airplanes do you think you've been on? Oh my god, I don't even know. Luckily, though, I feel like it wasn't that many, like, cumulative airplanes, just because I feel like I always try to, like, get the direct flights going, okay. but it's just, like, a lot of time in travel. Mm-hmm. I think I always forget that, especially going east. So, like, going over to Europe, you just lose so much time. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. Or, heck, just going to Boston, you lose a lot of time. I feel like I got over there. I'm like, what the heck happened to my entire day? <laughs> yeah, I feel like you always lose a day to Boston. Yeah, yeah. But, no, it's good. Like, I feel like it was, like, a really fun and productive, what was it, like, two and a half, almost three weeks, and now, like, back and just kind of ready to grind for the rest of the Chicago build. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So let's kind of zoom out for a moment and just some folks might be listening for the first time to mm-hmm. this series, the build up. Yeah. And here we are just kind of documenting your mental and physical prep mm-hmm. to the Olympic trials marathon in February, once mm-hmm. a month we're chatting. Yeah. And we released our first episode last month, which we had mm-hmm. awesome feedback on, which was cool. Yeah, that was, I was like so amazed just like how many people responded really, really positively to that. I feel like it's always a little bit scary, like going to that vulnerable place and being like, I hope people like our thing. And I felt like we got so much just like positivity back from that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I think it was really fun because also people who weren't runners also listened to it. Like Mm -hmm. my best childhood friend, Lily, shout out, listen to it. (laughs) And she was a little confused by some of our (laughs) like running nerd stuff. So I was thinking maybe we could break down just explaining like, what is the Olympic trials marathon? So yeah. for people who are not in deep like us, yeah, <laughs> like what is the Olympic trials marathon, Molly? And then what is it like, what are you going to have to do to make the Olympic team? Yeah. So for people listening who are not fully immersed in the running world, so quote unquote, normal people, um, the Olympic trials marathon is our qualification procedure for the Paris 2024 Olympics. So Every four years, there is a Summer Olympics in which the the marathon is one of the events, and that is my main event. And prior to that, generally in the February before the Summer Games, there is a qualifying event. So any U.S. marathoner that wants to try and qualify for the Olympics, you have to run a race in February and come top three in that race in order to qualify for the Olympics. Um, you also have to hit a certain time standard. Um, I actually don't know what that time standard is off the top of my head, um, but I like. <laughs> Have you made the time I standard? So dumb. Have I, you heard the time standard? I think like I think I've got like I haven't run a marathon in now almost two years, okay. so like I'll need to try and run it. I think it's two twenty nine. It might be two twenty six. I actually have no idea. Maybe two two twenty six sounds more correct. I think 226. We'll look into it. We'll look into that. We'll we'll tell you next time what that time standard is. I always just figure, because the U.S. is very competitive in the marathon, that just by the nature of getting top three in the trials, you generally are hitting the time standard. That's what the case was the last time in Atlanta, and that was an extremely difficult course. So, yeah, basically you got to go get top three, perform on the day, and get this time standard and then you can go to the Olympics. So that is my goal for the next however many months up until February 3rd. Yeah. How often do you think about February 3rd that day? Does it come up for you on a daily basis or in your training? Do you ever visualize it? Um, Yeah, it it comes up a lot. Um, Not always in a positive way. I feel like I'll get sometimes like the intrusive thoughts of just like the worry about it just because it's really hard being... Uh, an athlete in a sport where so much of our career is defined by the Olympics. So like effectively one day every four years. And it creates quite a bit of anxiety of like, if you don't make the Olympic team, that is has huge ramifications for your, your contract, for your career as a runner. And so I've been really trying to work through some of those emotions of just realizing like, yeah, at the end of the day, this is just another race. And like, Obviously, my big goal is to qualify for the Paris 2024 Olympics, but you never know what's going to happen, and like you just have to kind of deal with it, and all I can do is just prepare as best I can. But yeah, I think it it definitely comes up a lot in my brain, um, sometimes in negative ways, but other times in positive ways, as like a, a good motivator. 
Yeah, Yeah. and when the negative thoughts come up, what do you say to them? Like when they feel intrusive, or how do you redirect them? I that's something that I feel like I'm still figuring out. It's so different this time around because the last time around, uh, when I ran the the Olympic trials back in 2020, like it just wasn't even a thought of my mind of qualifying for the team. So it wasn't that kind of like anxiety. It was coming more from a place of like, wow, I get to do this event rather than, oh shit, like I have to do this event. Like I have all of these expectations. I have to go out and perform. And so it's kind of trying to reframe back into that. Um, Actually, no, not even back into that because I feel like you can't put the genie back in the bottle of that. Like I can't ever go back to that spot of just like, I'm going to pretend like there's no pressure. It's like, yeah, there is a lot of pressure right now. And there's a lot of expectations coming back as the, yeah, the Olympic bronze medalist. So it's like trying to look at these expectations as an opportunity and a really cool opportunity that I get to have. Yeah, I know we both respect and know Lauren Fleshman, but Mm -hmm. something she said about running is that it's like a privilege to choose your suffering. Yeah, I love that. I think that is like the perfect, um, just like the perfect metaphor for it because it's like you're going to suffer regardless. I feel like that's just like the, what life is. Life is suffering. And the fact that we get to choose our suffering in this thing that like that I do love to do yeah running sucks but it is also this incredible beautiful thing and so it's like the fact that I have the ability in my life to get to go out and choose this thing that makes me so miserable every single day but I love it is wonderful (laughs) and when you say that you have positive thoughts about the race like Mm -hmm. what are those positive thoughts are there images that come up feelings Mm -hmm. like what I think like I truly just love running marathons especially like that feeling of being in the pack and just going full tilt and being deeply immersed in the race like the the energy of the race and a true race not one of these marathons where it's just you have your pacer and you're going out and trying to hit a time like I feel like the Olympic trials marathon is just like the this epitome of like what American road racing is and that's such a cool feeling like Whenever I get really deep in the weeds of like the anxiety surrounding the race and what the outcome is going to be, I try to really center myself in the fact that just like, I'm just really freaking excited to do that race because it is just such a cool thing to get to do. And not many people get to do it. There's, I mean, just a few hundred people in the U S that get to run the trials. And so it's like, it's a really fun, cool, amazing thing that I get to do. Yeah. I also think this element of you being surrounded by all these women and all of mm-hmm. them, like, you know, and respect Yeah, like that all of you are going to get to be there on that day together. It's mm-hmm. just feels really magical to me. Yeah. And I think like, it is such a privilege to be able to do it. And like, not in like a cheesy way of just like, I hope everybody has a good time. It's like, yeah, like when I'm out there, I want to kick their asses. But like, these are really incredible women that I really look up to. Like, I mean, getting to go and run with women that like, I even used to see as like my heroes and be like counted among them, I think is just a really cool feeling. So I think that's it is like the, the trials is such a, like it's almost got this like mythos around it within the sport of running that, yeah, I think it's very easy for people even who aren't within that, like the, the bubble of running to understand that, that it's just like, yeah, you have like, you have to go out and you have to perform on the day and it's just top three. And it's this cool thing where the best of the best in our country are going to be there on that day. And we just see who shakes out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's bookmark that. Cause I want to return more to the trials. Yeah. And I also want to kind of talk about this past month. You mm-hmm. have two different races. You mm-hmm. were in Germany, you were in France and Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> you had a lot of adventures. And when I, you look back on August, mm-hmm. what do you feel like was the high of the experience for you? What was the low? Mm. I, I feel like there were a lot of highs, like a lot of like different highs. And then also just like a lot of kind of like learning experiences that are hard, but I feel like in the grand scheme of things are like, positive takeaways from them even though they might not be super fun in the moment Mm. yeah so it's like I feel like the maybe the probably the biggest high was racing Falmouth out in Boston I flew out um like kind of like mid-August and Falmouth road race is a seven mile road race from Woods Hole Massachusetts to Falmouth right along the coast and it was just like a super fun race I feel like it's the first time in a while that I've just felt like 
actually really good in a race and like performed well and like raced well and then by um a quirk of the the airline system uh my my boyfriend matt had had his flight canceled and so he decided to drive through the night up and like surprise me at the finish and it was just like i felt like it was like just one of those great days it's like it's just like fun the weather's great like you're next to the beach my super hot boyfriend is there like it was just like everything was like as good as I could have imagined it. <laughs> when you saw Matt at the finish line, did you think it was like a ghost? Like how did you? Oh, it was, I didn't even see him at the finish. I was, for the listeners here, Matt is over in the corner. So he's blushing right now. Um, but uh, basically I finished, I was in the mix zone at the end and I called John, my coach, to like talk to him after the race. Cause I was like happy, race went really well. And he was like, there's, um, there's a special fan that wants to meet you. And I'm like, oh fuck. <laughs> Oh, who, what weirdo was it? Is this like some like Georgetown kid that like John wants me to meet? And he's like, he's right outside the area. And I look over and I almost dropped my phone. I was so surprised because the last person I expected to see was Matt. Apparently Matt had been along the course and I was just zoning out and didn't see him. But uh, yeah, I was so surprised because I was like, you're supposed to be in France right now. (laughs) Like, it was it was just so shocking and then it was just like so much fun getting to like hang out and whatnot and then he almost missed his flight coming back because he had to drive all the way back down to New York City Aww, yeah Matt you're amazing oh mm-hmm. that's yeah, really special truly, truly claps for yeah. claps for Matt claps for Matt <laughs> I love that I feel like surprising people is not something I think we do as much in our world today mm-hmm. in part because of I think our technology and how interconnected we are through yeah. texting, Instagram, mm-hmm. phone, everything. Yeah. And so the thought of just surprising someone feels so amazing and genuine. Yeah. I, I like, honestly too, I feel like even just like little things like for some, Oh, actually I almost ruined the surprise for myself because speaking of that, like on find my friends, I was going to check to make sure that he had made it up to Chamonix. Okay. Cause he was supposed to be in Chamonix at that time. And so I was like, cause we had like booked his shuttle and whatnot. And I was like, just wanted to make sure that like everything was going smoothly. And just by the quirk of like calling John, I didn't check it. And so it like kept the surprise because otherwise I would have seen that he was like right there at the finish. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And so when you say the race went well, Mm -hmm. what went well about the race? Um, I felt like, like that race is so fast. Um, like M. Sisson was there, Helen O'Beary. So like really like people who are just like absolutely crushing it right now and like really fast runners. And I felt like the pace got out hot and I was able to like hang on at the beginning and then hold a like a pretty solid pace throughout to like basically when I finished even though I got like I wasn't like in one of the top spots but the time that I finished in was the best time that I've ever run there and I felt like I just really competed well and held a a faster than marathon pace like really steadily throughout the whole race and kept it pretty consistent like I didn't fall off the pace and I stayed engaged so I think that's the thing that I'm looking for like when I'm racing well of like being able to just like hold those paces and stay in it and stay engaged so I came away from it just like really happy with like how it went and feeling like pretty confident um in in just how I performed hell yeah yeah were there ever any moments, because when I hear you say staying engaged, like you felt well, mm-hmm. but I also know you ran really hard. So mm-hmm. it must have also felt hard and uncomfortable at times. Yeah. I I think there's a lot of like, especially with some of these like faster races. I mean, a seven mile race is much, much faster than what we run marathon pace at. I think I averaged like maybe like 510 to 513 per mile. And so it's like, you're actively having to kind of stay up on the pace and not... Uh, not let your mind slip and slip into a slower pace, which can be very, very easy to do. So I feel like it requires a lot of focus um, and just focus in a different way than you usually have in a marathon. And it flexes different like muscles in your brain almost. Yeah. Yeah. And also just being able to be okay with knowing that like, okay, the, like the lead pack is ahead of me and there's a separate race, but I'm still going to run my same race back here Mm -hmm. and do what I need to do back here and, and still feel confident in that and not let it like get to me of like, Oh yeah. Like I'm not even top three. And it's like, so what? Like I'm still racing while I'm doing what I need to do. Yeah. And were you around anyone? Were there any men or women around you when you were racing? 
Um, there was a Kenyan woman who was pretty close to me. Fiona O'Keefe was a little ways in front of me, but for long stretches of time, it was pretty like strung out. Like it's a, it's a tough race. It's kind of like rolling Hills and it's always very hot. And so it's like the kind of thing where the pack just like splinters. So how do you stay engaged when there's not many people around you? Cause I think for mm-hmm. people who aren't professional, when you're going to a race, you oftentimes have lots of people around yeah. you. And so it's a very different experience than what like mm-hmm. the masses experience. Yeah, I think it's tough sometimes and I do this better at times than other times, but being able to like find almost that that line, like that edge that you know, like, okay, this is really uncomfortable and this is difficult to maintain, but I know that I can keep at this for however long. I, I think it's like it's a little bit scary sometimes, and this is something that I've been trying to like work through in training of like being able to ride that line and trust a little bit and be outside that comfort zone in a way that like I think the brain is very good at protecting itself and very good at telling you like, no, this is fast enough. Don't go any faster. Otherwise you'll blow up. And it sometimes just takes a lot of races to figure out where that line is and where you can push that line. Um, and that's been a little bit of the difficulty of this last year of kind of getting back into racing of like rediscovering where that line is. Um, I think I did a very good job of it at Falmouth. I did a terrible job of it at 20 K, but that just comes with, with learning of figuring out like when are the times that I can push that line and when my brain is telling me, like, don't go past this, you're going to blow up. And when you're like, but what if I go a little bit past it? And sometimes you blow past it and then, you, yeah, you absolutely die. But sometimes that's where a really good race performance comes from. Yeah, there's, like, f- there's a lot of almost, like, there's a craft to it. Yeah. Of, like, a practice of being able to show up. I think in our last conversation you talked about this idea of, like, mental callousing. Mm-hmm. And that being something that you have to practice. Yeah. Building those mental muscles. And I'm almost yeah. hearing inside of kind of how you conceptualize your brain is knowing, mm-hmm. like, there's a line and being able to find that space. Yeah. Where you're, like, pushing past the line, but not mm-hmm. too far that you're in mm-hmm. in the hole. Yeah. Um, and the more you practice that and kind of finding that within yourself, mm-hmm. you know, in Internally. And I think that's like what the cool thing about running is like so many people want to like and I do this all the time of over focusing on the physical aspect of running like obviously that's a big part of it but I think that aspect of self discovery through like discovering the the capabilities of our body I think is truly one of like the coolest things about running that it's like when you go out and you do really really hard things you are learning more about yourself and you're learning about where are my limits when can I push those limits like where can my brain go when it's like put into a really difficult position and I think it teaches you so much about yourself. And I think that's ultimately the most powerful thing about running that like why people keep coming back to it. Cause there's just not a whole lot of things in our lives where you have to really come up against like who you are as a person and like how deep you're willing to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love that self-discovery is something that I think people all ages, all paces, all types of runners experience. Mm -hmm. It's not obviously you're engaging with that practice of self-discovery a lot because Mm -hmm. you run many times a week (laughs) Um, and it's your job but I think it's something everyone experiences yeah and and I think that's the really cool thing like when I talk with like just like normal normal runners normal amateur runners um who aren't professionals like like that is a universal thing and like seeing someone who even is just starting out running and like learning that about themselves would be like oh man like I never believed that I could run a marathon but I did it and it's like yeah like that's a really cool feeling to be able to push past these like perceptions that we have about ourselves and like what our capabilities are that it's like that's no different of like someone who never thought they could run a marathon and then finish it like and that's the exact same as me never thinking I could win an Olympic medal and then like doing it it's that kind of thing of just like Sometimes you have to do things before you're ready and running allows us to do that. 
Yes, so mm. good. And in the past month, I know you went to UTMB and you were there in mm. Chimney. Yeah. And I mean, talk about self discovery. Some oh of those God. runners, <laughs> just Courtney, Jim, Zach. Mm. I mean, I know I'm speaking to the American runners who performed there, but mm. truly incredible performances. Yeah. And I'm wondering, what was your experience like training in Chimney and what was it like to mm-hmm. witness ultra running? Oh, it's such a cool part of the sport. Actually, I see ultra running is almost like a completely different sport than what we do just because it's like the technical aspects of it are bonkers to me. Like it effectively is a very different kind of running. Seeing those mountains too, I always convince myself, I'm like, I would be so good at trail running. And then I actually see what trail running is and I'm like, fuck that. Like absolutely not. (laughs) Um, But it's so cool because it is all of those same things that I experience in professional road running just on a much more extended time scale. And I think in a different level like when when you listen to Courtney DeWalter talk about like going into her pain cave and whatnot like I like I can recognize so many aspects of that but it's very hard for me to conceive of doing that over the course of 23 hours like that is insane to me to be able to maintain that level of focus for that long and I think that's ultimately what is so mind-boggling about those performances that's like I mean they're just going to a place that other people are not going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which race, which performance left you most inspired or curious that you saw? I feel like I was inspired by so many different things. Like it's really cool getting to know some of these top level um ultra runners and like so my boyfriend Matt, he shoots um, for a couple of the racers. So he was shooting for Katie Scheid, who took second at OCC, and watching her do OCC, which is a 50k race, after she had just gotten second at the Western States Hundred Miler. So like vastly different distances, and being highly competitive in both of them, and just seeing that range, I think was so impressive, but also she was not in second when we saw her probably with, I want to say like 15 miles to go. And she was able to like focus and move up through the field and trust that she would be able to like catch up to these girls who went out really, really fast. Um, and so I think being able, like seeing that amount of just like confidence in your race plan, I think was really inspiring and cool. Um, Another another performance that obviously it wasn't um, it didn't go the way that he thought it was going to go. But our friend Tom Evans, after he just won Western States, he raced UTMB and he had a really tough race. He ended up having to drop out of it. But I think I was honestly really inspired by that of just his willingness to after a really long season to still go after a big goal and to like risk failure and. Like sometimes you're not always going to get that goal. Sometimes it's not going to go the way you think, but to put yourself in that, I think is a really inspiring thing regardless. And to go after these things and not be like, oh yeah, like I won my big thing for the year. Like this is it. Like I'm just going to go like, like rest of my laurels. Like that desire to keep getting after it, I think is really, really inspiring and knowing that he's going to be back and absolutely get after it the next time he does, chooses to do UTMB, I think is really cool. Um, and then like, finally, obviously Courtney DeWalter doing the triple crown, which wasn't even a thing because nobody thought you could even do like hard rock and Western States and UTMB all in one year is amazing. Um, and then, our, our Coconino cowboy, Jim Walmsley, bringing home the dub. Have you run with Jim at all from Flagstaff? Or? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. More like a couple years ago when I was coming out here training when I was a little bit younger. Um, and uh, just seeing him a lot when he was trying to prep for the trials in 2020 when he was going to try to go back onto the roads. But um, yeah, he's been over in France for the last two years. And it's just like his commitment to like knowing that he needed to like be in a place and go all in to prep for this, I think is just like, damn, that's, that's a level of commitment that not many people have. I feel like you have that commitment to your running. Yeah. I mean, living at altitude, living here in Flagstaff for Mm -hmm. you, I know you love it here. And I think for you, that's your version of that. Yeah. I think it's like seeing that he's like knows that he has to go to a place where it's like he recognizes like the terrain in Flagstaff is not going to be 
enough. Like he has to go put himself into a, a situation that he's not quite good at. Um, actually, you are kind of right because I'm realizing that that's what I'm doing with Chicago right now. Um, realize, like I'm thinking of the similarities of like Jim was like obviously this much faster, like had won Western States, like was very much known for being like for flatter, faster courses. And he's like, oh, like, I need to put myself in, like, go after, like, these big mountains, lots of vert, and, like, try something that I know I'm maybe not as naturally good at. And I'm realizing now, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me trying to go and do a flat, fast marathon in Chicago, knowing that I am more suited to hills, but I need to put myself in the situation to grow a little bit. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that is a really beautiful parallel. Mm -hmm. And I want to return back to Chicago later in our conversation. Um, But yeah, so from France, after France, you went to New Haven. Mm -hmm. And you already kind of alluded here that it didn't go as you'd wanted. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) And do you feel like that was kind of the low for you of the past? Because you said it sounds like you had some learnings. Yeah, yeah. I think it was... So I went out to New Haven and had like had been training really well going into it, like had had a really good workout the Tuesday before, um, felt like I was just like, okay, like let's keep the good momentum going and got into that race. And the goal was just to go out and race. Um, so I went out with the lead pack. Um, so like M Durgan, M Sisson, um, Edna Kiplagat and Annie Frisbee, and we were rolling like probably, so a 20 K is a little shorter than a half marathon. And we went through the first mile in like five minute pace, so far faster than I usually race for that distance and held it for mm, about five miles, maybe six miles, and then just exploded. Like my, like my lungs felt okay, but my legs literally just like seized up and it was just like, nope, absolutely not it. So I pretty, like I, I was running about like six minute pace by the end of it. And just like a one minute spread in paces is not how you run a half marathon fam like (laughs) that's not it (laughs) and so I guess that's where I was really disappointed in myself of like just felt like I raced it really stupidly of like almost like Icarus going too close to the sun of just like yeah I can totally go out and run five minute pace at the beginning of a half and yeah saw the ramifications of that of just like no like I have to pay the price for going too far over that line but that's how you learn And I think I took a a little, like I took the day afterwards to kind of process and, and mope a little bit and just think about like, what are the lessons that I'm going to need to learn from that race rather than just getting demoralized of like, I mean, that was my last show of fitness before Chicago and it was a pretty piss poor show of fitness, but rather than getting demoralized by it, how do I learn from that experience and go forward into the next five weeks, just trying to make the most of it. Yeah. What do you, what do you feel like you learned? I think one of the big things I learned is that I need to be one kind of just like realistic about like where the fitness is and what the goal of Chicago is of like, it's very fun to try and go out with the lead pack and do this amazing performance, but realize like, I'm not there yet. Like after this last two years of what I've been through, like I want to set really big goals, but going out and trying to compete with women who have been training consistently for the last two years while I've been kind of working through my stuff. That's just not where I'm at right now. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to be there, but where I am right now, that's a recipe for me having a really bad day in Chicago. Um, so being able to trust of like, okay, like I need to treat Chicago as the stepping stone that it is and tackle some of the closer goals rather than this big thing right now of like being one of the top runners at a major marathon that's not what Chicago is for me. And 20K was a reality check of knowing like, okay, like I'm pretty sure M. Sisson is going to try and go out and run the American record at Chicago. And if I try to go with her, it will be a very bad day for me. So it's like, I need to recognize that the goal right now is to have a positive experience and build momentum through that race. And for me, that means going after a time closer to like 220 to 222. Um, rather than like sub 218. Yeah, it sounds like 
it was a real lesson for you and what it means to run your race right now. Exactly. Where yeah. you're at. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's like, it's a little bit of these aspects of growing up, of realizing that like, okay, like these first few marathons that I did, it was very much of just like that full said mentality of just like, I'm just going to put my nose in at the front and just see where it shakes out. And through the grace of like being very fit and sometimes very lucky that worked out a lot of the time, but I can't rely on that all the times. And I have to take a little bit more mature approach of like, I need to run my race and, and recognize what my race is as well. Um, so yeah, I think that was like a, a big takeaway from that. Um, and just realize like, yeah, we're building this back up and I have to like, not limit myself, but also recognize, like, be, be realistic about what things are. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so getting a little into the nuts and bolts of training, like what does your training for Chicago look like right mm-hmm. now? How many runs a week do are you doing? What's yeah. your mileage like? Um, how many workouts do you do? I know yeah. some, some people like to nerd, nerd out on that. Yeah. So generally my training, when I'm like in the thick of it for marathon training, I usually run twice a day, every day. Um, today I won't just because my mileage is high this week. I did a long run this morning, but um, I'm usually doing two like main workouts a week, um, either on Tuesday, Friday or Wednesday, Saturday, and then a long run on the weekend, um, anywhere from 20 to 24 miles. And in between, it's a lot of easy mileage. Typically when I'm like at peak mileage comes out to between like 130, 135. Um, it's been a little bit lower the last few weeks. So closer to like 115 to 120, um, just while I've been traveling and racing and doing all that. But when I'm here in flag, just like the head down, like trying to crush it, it's like pretty high. I like high mileage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you look back on this past week of running, Mm -hmm. what run stands out for you as the hardest or what one was like the most joyful? Mm, So probably the, I feel like we, I had like three very hard runs of like the race was Monday. So oh, technically okay. is this week. It's been such a weird week with that. But like, because of that, we waited to work out until Friday and then we did a double threshold day. So like double threshold is a really big staple of our training for people who like aren't in the thick of Norwegian running theory. Double threshold is the idea that you run at your lactate threshold pace, um, which is pretty close to your marathon pace um, for just repetitions. Generally, I do one to two miles for those. And uh, I try to get in close to like 12 miles of workout volume for that. So we did seven by mile in the morning over on a loop in town and with 60 seconds rest in between. And then in the afternoon, we come back on the track and do another five to six miles of work. Um, and it was a tough day. Just like for me, that's a really big volume of workout. Um, I know for some of the marathoners in town, they look at that as like cake. But for me, like 12 miles of threshold work is a lot. So uh, it felt really good to to be in that afternoon session and it just be really, really hard and have to really focus on like hitting my paces um, and just trusting John that I'm like, he gave me what I thought was way too much and just be like, nope, like I'm just going to lean into it and just be okay with it and trust that I'm not going to absolutely explode. (laughs) And did you explode? I, we cut off the final kilometer of, so basically the workout in the afternoon was two miles, two by mile, four by K. So we ended up just doing three by K at the end because my form was starting to break down a bit. But um, I've been trying to work on this mentality of a lot of times I'll get this like defeatist attitude sometimes or like hear a workout and be like, oh my God, that's way too much. I can't do that. And uh, John is a very big fan of like, like professional chefs. He loves like David Chang. He loves Anthony Bourdain. And so because of that, I've tried to cultivate this mentality a little bit of when John tells me to do something or when he's like, okay, the next two miles have to be sub 520. And in my mind, I'm like, fuck that. I cannot run a 520 mile right now. I just, in my mind, I'm like, yes, chef, 
we're going to run a 520 mile. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because it's like when you're in a professional kitchen, one of their sous chefs is not telling David Chang, oh, no, I cannot make that risotto right now. That's way too much. He's like, yeah, yes, chef. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Because if John, when John writes these workouts, he writes it with the knowledge that he believes that I can do it. And so if John believes I can do it, I've got to believe I can do it too. Even if I think it's batshit crazy. <laughs> but... Yeah, I feel like I'm trying to cultivate that mentality of just like, I need to lean into these things, even if I think I can't do it or it's outside of my wheelhouse, because John believes I can do it. And he has a a frankly ridiculous amount of belief in me sometimes. But (laughs) yeah, I just got to trust it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Friday was a really big day. Mm -hmm. Was there a run? It could have been a shakeout or an easy run that brought you a lot of joy this past week. Oh, trying to think of just like fun runs um one of my like uh um a friend of mine just moved into town um mckenna miler and it i ran with her on saturday the morning afterwards and it was really nice we just went like super easy out on woody mountain road um and she's got two kids now and is just like she's a professional athlete but just like in the thick of like being a mom and it's just like so much fun getting to hear about like people just in different phases of life that are doing really cool things same thing I ran with um my friend Rachel um Schneider Smith on what day was that Thursday and she had a baby about five months ago as well and just like hearing the joy that they're like going through and obviously it's really tough like being a breastfeeding mom while also being a pro athlete and I feel like it's a really good perspective just being like man they are like in the thick of life right now and just so filled up with like joy I think that's the really fun thing to just get to talk with them and just like just see like everybody's kind of going through a different thing and we're all working hard and doing it yeah Mm -hmm. what a treat to get to connect with other women yeah maybe that's it is like I think I just appreciate like the community of like women runners that we have here of just like like I know that's like such a like a trope in like the culture right now just like badass women doing things but like legitimately to be surrounded by women of like all phases of life doing so many things I think is really cool that like I don't feel like we get enough in like our current culture of just like a really strong supportive community of women. I mean, heck, even today we had a long run. Um, and it was me and M Durgan and Kellen Taylor and Katya Goldring. And we were like going to the well on this run, but just being like, man, like it's so cool that we have like all of us here. We all have such different lives and yet we can just like get after it on this long run. And Kellen's going back to her kids and Em's going to hang out with her boyfriend and Katja's boyfriend was riding with us along. Matt's out in the back of the truck, like shooting. It's just like, damn, it's like really cool that like one, our partners are all like supporting us in this. And two, like we have each other to get through what was an absolutely grueling fucking run. (laughs) Yeah, when you say going to the well, Mm -hmm. were you talking? Like, tell me what that means or looks like for you. Yeah, we were talking throughout, um, but like going at a good clip. Like, it was was pretty fast. Um, A1 Mountain Road is basically like kind of like a lollipop you climb seven miles and then you do a circumnavigation of wing mountain which is another seven miles but on the back side of that is the most egregious hill like this hill is disrespectful and so we were going really hard and like we're all working together and going at it but like it's kind of this unspoken agreement that like when you hit that hill it's going to like, you're going to do what you need to do. So like M just blows up the hill. Kellen's like right behind her. I fell off. Katya was behind me. And so it's like, we're all just like in it trying to get up that hill. And then M uh, decided to like keep it pretty crisp for the final seven miles when you descend back to the start point. Um, And Kellen, Katya and I kind of like repacked and took it a little bit like less crispy on the way back down. Crispy (laughs) Crispy is the term that we use to describe super fucking fast. Um, But yeah, it was really nice to be able to have that of like, I feel like there's not like egos going into it. Like everybody's just doing what they need to do. And yeah, it's just fun having that support of like, it was a, that was the best run I've had on a one. And I couldn't even tell you how long probably ever, but, um, for that, but like for someone like Kellen, she is the queen of a one. Like she literally has the fastest time any woman's ever run there. And so it's like, for her, this was like a super easy day and it's fun that we get to like share that. And I get the, I feel like I get to like learn from her experience and strength on that route. 
Yeah, so going mm-hmm. up that hill, I've run it before. I mm-hmm. ran it two weekends ago. It is egregious. Oh, yeah, great um, for you. <laughs> and, and my dog is running, and he's just bounding up ahead. And I'm just like, please Rude. pull me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we let him off leash, so he was not pulling me. Yeah. But um, what do you think about, like, when you're going uphill, and it's getting hard during a long run like today, you're not in a race. It's not necessarily like a, mm-hmm. you know, capital W workout. Like, yeah. what, how are you... Mm, a lot of Staying times with yourself a lot of times I'm like almost like like distilling it down to like like muscular engagement like making sure that my body's moving well and efficiently up the hill um and I don't know it's funny because a lot of times I'm not like thinking like motivating thoughts of like you can do this because that's not how my brain works it's the it's almost more of just like I seeing Kellen in front of me and just being like you just have to hang on and she was just eating me up up the hill. But, like, just keeping that of just, like, the only thing in the world you have to do right now is get to the top of the hill as fast as you can. And it's really nice just, like, having that just, like, like your entire essence at that moment is just get up big hill. And it's, like, it's kind of nice. I love it. Yeah, and I think that's why, like, I have a lot more doubts and thoughts when I'm not with other people. Like, that's a very hard route to do solo. But when you're with other people, it can just be that. Like, even if you think the pace is too fast, it's just like, nope, I just got to stay with them because I don't want to have to be alone for 23 miles. Um, And... Yeah, I think that's why I enjoy long run days like this because it's like when you've got a really good, strong group of women around you to like push you, that's all it has to be is just like get to top of hill, stay with pack, like very little uncomplicated things. Yeah, I think that's one of the most blessed parts about running Mm -hmm. is this way in which it brings you right into the present moment. Yeah. So that you're not, you're Mm -hmm. not thinking, you're not even motivating yourself much. You're just Mm -hmm. focusing on the person in front of you getting up the hill. It's almost like Mm -hmm. just gets things really simple. Exactly. It's like the core essence of things. And it's like, you're not thinking about like, what does getting up this hill mean about me? And it's just like, no, it's like, you just have to get up it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's like same thing with like racing. It's just like get to there as fast as you can. Like it's a it's a cool thing that you get to have. Yeah, it is really cool. Mm-hmm. So the next time you record will probably be after Chicago. Mm-hmm. What would look like a really good day for you there? What do you think we would be an outcome or an experience that you would feel really excited or proud of? I think being able to go out and <sighs> it's tough because I feel like I keep like having to think about like what the like not like adjusting my goals but being able to be confident in knowing that like I want the experience to be a good one and to be able to build this momentum through because like Chicago is I'm kind of seeing the kind of the start of this next year which is like a big year and use it as this building block but also be able to go out and be like, yeah, I'd like really want to race hard and have fun with it and like go to the well. So I think like finding that line between like being able to have a good day that is not risking at all or like going too fast and blowing up spectacularly. I think being able to go and build throughout the race, like hopefully maybe negative split, we'll see, or at the very least hold a consistent pace throughout. Um, And stay really engaged in what I'm doing. I think I really get disappointed in myself in races where I feel like I've like given up. Like almost that's what 20K was. It's just like my body was so shot. I just felt like I like gave up in the last few miles because I'm like, I physically can't go anymore. And it just feels like you're not even racing anymore. So I feel like I want to be able to go out and race hard and know that I gave everything I had out there, but also realize like, yeah, this is just the first step for the next year. Um, yeah, almost approach it in the way that I approached London in, in 2020 of just like, yeah, I know the front end of that race is going to be like record pace and be happy and content with what my race is. Yeah, I mm-hmm. hear that you want to be really present and engaged and stay mentally and physically engaged and also stay within yourself. Yeah, 
And I wonder for people who are spectating, Mm -hmm. because there might be people who spectate who listen to the pod. Yeah. What would be things that you'd, what lifts you up? Or do you even hear people on the sidelines? I do hear people on the sidelines. I love it when people have signs too. Like people make the funniest like signs. Um, And I like, there are like times where I'll like, yeah, like remember certain things throughout the race of just like a really like remarkable like thing going on. But yeah, I feel like I'm trying to think of like what like, Nice, because like my family will be there too, and I never know what people like what to tell people to like shout at me. I think like for me, I feel like the at the very least, like what I've been thinking about over this last week is just being a lot more grown up and adult with how I approach racing. Like I feel like, especially through the trials in the Olympics, it was a lot more of like a almost like this younger, like kind of childish, like she's the fun young one. Um, and I feel like I raced a lot like that of like this very full said mentality of just go out and just race hard and like not care about anything. It's like being able to be a lot more mature with how I race of like respecting my body, respecting the sport that I'm doing, but also knowing that like, I'm a grown ass woman and this is like my job. Like, it's, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this, of like, when I go out, I don't want it to have to be this like, big thing of like, every race is like, defining me as a person and whatnot. It's like, I'm going out and I'm doing a job and I'm going to work really fucking hard because I've got really big goals with this. But at the end of the day, it is just running. (laughs) And I think like, approaching it like that, of just like, being able to approach it like, strong and maturely and stoically if that's kind of the right yeah it almost hears like you want to have a more of a level of professionalism exactly because I'm yeah hearing almost it sounds like your younger self had a bit more of a playfulness and mm-hmm. that still is a part of you because yeah. you do have a sense of humor and that mm-hmm. is core to who you are yeah and I hear you want to grow into a bit more mm-hmm. of yeah stoic and maybe centered yeah I think maybe that's it a little more centered because I feel like that kind of like that crazy like fun loving mentality I feel like it came with a lot of volatility for me and it was very much of this aspect of like whatever I'm feeling at that current moment is my entire self um we talk about the Enneagram a lot and I am a four for listeners um and I feel like as part of that is this like this part of myself that I don't love, that it's like this consumption in my emotions and this inability to be able to separate myself from my thoughts and feelings. Um, And I feel like I've really been working hard on that to be able to tweeze out this sense that like, I am not my thoughts. I am not my feelings. And I just think of how I was going into New York, which was a very, very good performance for me, but it came with so much emotional volatility that I was like, in the thick of it with like ED relapse and like with the broken ribs and with everything. And I was just so mired in these emotions and it was such an up and down thing that like, I want to be able to approach these races and be just even keeled with it and not be fueling my race performances off of either this huge emotional high or just this like darkness and pain. I want to be able to fuel it from the support of people I have around me from this internal strength that I know that I have that's there regardless of how I'm feeling in the moment. So I think maybe that's it, and that's the goal for Chicago, is to really start practicing and implementing just drawing upon this like calm strength that I know I have in me, but I need to cultivate it and work on it because it doesn't come supernaturally to me sometimes. Yeah. How do you think you will navigate like previous nerves? I like think, what helps you in that process? Because nerves do come up. Mm-hmm. I think that's the tricky part. And being able to know the that one, I've got a great support network around me. I'm going to have John there. I'm going to have Matt there. I'm going to have my family there. And it's not this like, man, it's me against the world. Like I've got so many people around me that are invested in me and willing to work so hard for this objectively very silly career that I've chosen for myself and realize that that it's like I like yeah I I have so much support and so many people who are rooting for me and then also the I think something that I've been ruminating on this last week is 
I have worked very, very hard for all of like all of this. I'm working really hard. I've worked really hard in the mental health stuff. I've worked really hard on like getting my fitness back. And then when I didn't race well at 20K, it was this very childish feeling of just like, this isn't fair. I have worked so hard and I didn't get the result I wanted. This is very unfair. And realizing, like, grow the fuck up. Like, just because you work hard is no guarantee that any of this is going to work out. And you just have to, like, keep coming back and showing up regardless and not with the expectation that it's ever going to work out. And that's ultimately what the sport is. It's like you don't get any guarantees. Like, so what? You worked hard. So has everybody else. Like, it's the amount of times that you show up. I think that counts. So I think that's it. Chicago's just another another time showing up. Another drop in the bucket. Yeah. I think it's like, it's funny. I was, yeah, thinking of that. I was just like, it's it's really hard to beat someone who doesn't fucking give up. So it's like, I've just got to be that person. Like, it might not be now. It might not be next year. It might not be five years from now. But like, you just keep coming and doing it. And it's like, you'll outlive the bastards eventually. Yeah, I love that idea of just continuing to show up. Um, This past week, my partner, he's newer to running, um, Mm -hmm. and he asked me a question of, like, what he thought my lifetime miles was. Like, the amount of miles Mm. I've run in my lifetime. That's a really good one. And so I went down this rabbit hole. I have a lot of training journals that I've kept, like, hand training journals. Yeah. um, From the first couple years, I've been running for a lot less than you have, but, like, Mm. the past 10 years I've been running. Um, And so I went through, like, all my training journals, and then, like, I now keep my stuff online, and so I was, like, trying to calculate it. And I was wondering, for you you Mm -hmm. do you have a sense of what your lifetime miles are and where (laughs) are all your miles stored like girl I have no idea honestly like it's really tough I had been talking about this with Matt at some point and we were trying to calculate it out because I run really high mileage but it has been so volatile I've been through such like so many periods like long periods of injury I mean when yeah like when we first met you Mm -hmm. weren't running exactly yeah excuse me not first met but when we reconnected you weren't running for multiple months I know and I guess that's the hard thing to calculate out because like trying to I can't just be like oh I've run x number of miles every single week for the last however long it's been like very up and down with my mileage so it's like Girl, I couldn't even tell you. Do you did you keep training logs in high school or college? Or? So I've that's the thing. I've kept very different kinds of training logs, and so I don't have like one cohesive thing. Like when I was in high school, I would get those little, um, like it, like flip calendars or whatnot. So it would be like a month laid out, and I would just write every day like what my mileage has been. Um, and then when I was in college, it kind of shifted. I was using like training peaks for a while, and then. When I was on FTC, our coach wanted us to use Final Surge, and I hate Final Surge. I'm sorry to Final Surge people out there. John keeps trying to get me to use it, and that's just never going to happen. But the most consistent one that I've had is Strava because I love the platform. I love the bubbles. Um, And so for some reason, that has been since, basically since I switched to, like left FTC, um, and just started using Strava, like when I first started this marathon training thing. And I feel like since then I've just like gravitated to that as just like a very easy way for me to be consistent with it and a very fun way. Like I've gone back and forth on it with (laughs) my comfortableness of like people seeing my training and location publicly, but I feel like I'm in a good place with it now and just enjoy the platform. I enjoy the connection that I think it provides sometimes. Yeah, and when you say the bubbles, do you mean like the bubbles when you look at a month of like yes, that yeah. bubbles? So it because it'll do like um, I I don't know if it's like your training log or whatnot, but it's like one of the features that you go down and it's like all the weeks and it your mileage for the day or like your run comes up as a certain sized bubble. So like if you do a four mile run, it's like a smaller bubble. If you do a 20 mile run, it's a big bubble, and it, you'll have multiple bubbles on days where you have multiple runs, and there is legitimately nothing in the world that's more satisfying to me (laughs) than seeing my entire phone screen so it's like from top to bottom of all the weeks filled in completely with bubbles it is it's 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 a little extreme but it's like something that like there is like that is just like serotonin burst in my brain when I just see that and I'm like and like when I look at like because you can go back as far as you want. So now the fact that I've got consistently since 2019, all of my training in there, 
it's so satisfying to go back and look and like be able to easily see what my training has been in the past or be able to recognize like, okay, like the eight weeks leading into the Olympics, that was a lot of fucking bubbles, like great build, like leading into Boston in 2022, like not a lot of bubbles, not a great build. (laughs) And so it's like, for me, it's just like that complete, like, yeah, just like bubbles equal good. (laughs) Oh, I feel like I was talking about bubbles. I feel like we need to have to like blow bubbles. I know. I, like, I, <laughs> it sounds so silly. So but your friend Lily's going to be listening to this. Like, what are they talking yeah. about with bubbles? But well, maybe we'll put that in like the, the show notes. <laughs> we'll show her the bubbles. We'll show her the bubbles. We'll add some photos of a, a really nice bubble spread. Maybe the listeners, if you tag us on Instagram <laughs> with your best Strava bubble spread, so you know, I don't know if you know. I don't use Strava. I'm like you don't use Strava super at all. Super anti Strava, which is funny because my partner your works for partner Strava. works for Strava. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's so funny. Is it like, uh, do you not like the public nature of it? Yeah, I think that's it. I've mm-hmm. had a history with stalkers. And yeah. I've had some things in my past where I feel like mm-hmm. privacy feels really important to me. Yeah. Unlike you, my running doesn't inspire anyone. So like, I don't need to worry about it. <laughs> um, I am inspired by your running. I am inspired by your, uh, your upcoming marathon. Yeah, I'm running my first marathon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any advice for first marathon? Molly I think going into your first marathon like really relish it being your first time and like really relish just that aspect of like I got this piece of advice from Alexi Pappas before trials which I still like to this day really appreciate and it's like appreciate being a rookie at something and knowing that you're never going to get to have a first marathon again and no matter what the experience is like that's just a really cool thing for it to be your first time doing anything. And it's like, and you're going to be really prepared for this. Like you're going to be ready and just kind of trust your body in it. Like, yeah, you haven't, you haven't raced 26.2 miles like this before, but it's like, yeah, you, you're capable of it. Even if your brain doesn't think you're ready for it, you are. Thanks friend. Mm. So yeah, I think it would be a fun, I, yeah, I really appreciate all that. And I want to first, like a spark down on that is I actually have run the marathon distance before. Yes. I guided a blind runner at the 2015 or visually impaired runner, the 2015 Boston marathon who Alexi mm. actually now guides. Like, That's right. A lot, yeah. which is funny. But, um, so I have <laughs> run the ding. distance, yeah. but I've never done it in my own way, at my own pace. Yeah. I think that's um, it. You've always done it for another person. Yeah. And I think getting to I feel like racing a marathon, like getting to push your limits rather than being uh, like, obviously that's such a powerful thing, like running, like running as a guide, but your, your experience is governed by this other person. And like, this experience is all about you and about like your, your approach to those miles, where your brain goes to it. I think that's a really fun, powerful thing. And I'm so excited for you to like, just get to have that experience. Thank you. Well, I'll be excited to for both of us to get to talk about our marathons next time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll have both <laughs> done our marathons by then. Lots of lessons Stay learned. Stay tuned, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> but yeah, I think a challenge, I'd be curious, it'd be open. I don't know if Anne, your mom, has your training journals or if you have those here in Flag. Oh, I've got them, yeah. Here. Okay, but I am going to challenge you to, I think it'd be really cool for you to actually try to calculate your lifetime miles. Maybe we'll do that. We'll see it. We'll come back and see if we can calculate all the lifetime miles. Miles or you there. could just make like estimations of like on during times when you haven't been logging, but yeah. find the final surge password, get the old training <laughs> logs, get Strava. I think it would be really amazing and interesting. Yeah. I feel like we should have like a, do you feel inspired to do it? I, I, now I'm like kind of like excited to like figure out what this actual number is. I wonder what like the estimates like people would have, oh, like yeah. what people think <gasps> it is. Okay. Well, so when did you start running? I mean, you started in middle school, right? I started in middle school. What? So that's the thing. I wouldn't even know how to like calculate those. Talk like to your middle school coach, get like an estimation. Yeah. Man. Do you know your middle school coach? Yes, yes. My middle school coach is like one of those people. So he ended up being my high school coach then too. Um, His name's Brian Borkowski and is like to this day like one of the most influential people in my life. feel like he like set like is the person that made me fall in love with running and like set that as like you need to love running more than focus on the competition aspect. But yeah, we ran such low my Like When I was in high school, I would do, like, three miles a day or something. Like, nothing like what it is now. So, it's, like... That's 21 miles a week. 
Like, yeah. <laughs> it was just like at the time I remember, like I was at like CCD, so like like Catholic, like Wednesday night Catholic education, and there were like other kids from like the local uh, or like from a much bigger high school and like a powerhouse program. And I had just won state my freshman year. And when they found out that I was only running 20 miles a week, they gave me so much shit. And I was like, really like, I was really upset by it at first. And then (laughs) Brian was just like, like, I think they might just be jealous that you only have to run 20 miles a week to do that. I'm like, oh, I guess that's a nice way to like think about it. And it gave me a little bit more confidence, but I was just like, at the time it like hit me so hard. I'm like, I need to run more miles. <laughs> well, look at you now, you're running. Look at me running. and to this day, that trauma is still impacting me. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're running a lot. So, okay, so what age, so was it sixth grade, seventh grade? Seventh grade. Okay, so seventh grade you started and how old are you right now? I'm 29. Oh my gosh. 29 um so yeah i'd be curious any listeners give us give us your estimate give us your estimate hopefully maybe in the next seven months i'm not gonna um, i know you have a lot going on this month so you mm-hmm. don't need to calculate your lifetime <laughs> this month but we'll, we'll give you the next six months to do this yes <laughs> <laughs> or to just create an estimation. There was I'm like, going to try and create my estimation with the miles run up until the Chicago Marathon. Okay. So okay. it'll be like, because then, then it'll be just a moving target otherwise. Okay. True, true, true. Okay. But yeah, I'm curious. There was a man who I interviewed when I did Running on Own podcast, like version mm-hmm. one, named Wayne Levy. And mm-hmm. he's in part of the Boston running community. I'm not sure if you've ever met him. Mm-hmm. I think he works for the VA or he did. Lovely person. And he hit over 100,000 miles in his lifetime. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. You gotta be at least fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. See, that's. I think. I, no, I'm gonna. Actually, I don't want to give away my answers because I want to. Yeah, hear yeah. Me. I'll tell you off. There. You're not giving any of the <laughs> listeners any tips. I'm not giving them any. I don't know. Like, it's funny though. Like the thought of like like. I guess that doesn't like it, that wouldn't like motivate me to be like I want to try and run a hundred thousand lifetime miles. It's more of just like it's like the daily kind of thing. Like I think like the cumulative it's the bubbles. It's the I just love those goddamn bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> I just want my bubbles to all be nice and complete. But yeah, I guess that's it. It's not like being like man. I hope I've run a hundred thousand miles by the time I'm sixty. Like something like that doesn't necessarily like motivate me a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even think it's yeah. a more motivation. I think it's just a cool thing to think about. Like, wow, in your life, yeah, just how many miles how have been many covered? Miles are like, how many hours do you think you've been spent doing this art? And this- maybe that's like the hours aspect. Like, I love that aspect of or the thought of like the ten thousand hours or whatnot. Of yeah. just like, man, like you dedicate so much time to something. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's something really beautiful about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, and I think it like maybe that too of just like what you learn over the course of that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, wild things. We'll see. T- yeah, we'll get back to you guys on the number of miles. <laughs> so what are the collection sources that you're going to have to do? We're going to have to do all, like, these old, like, calendars. Going to have to do, probably look at some, tr- like, training calendars, not even logs. Because, like, for my first two years of college, I didn't really keep a training log. Um, it was in a pretty negative spot. So yeah, I didn't really want to mark that. And then just like, I've got a couple like handwritten journals. I've got training peaks. Yeah. I don't know. Cause even like I've switched, like I couldn't even just use like a similar platform for like watches. Cause I've had different watches like throughout yeah. and like, yeah, man, it's going to be an interesting challenge. Yeah, I think challenge. this is more than a one month assignment. Yeah, now I'm like worried. I'm going to have to, <laughs> we'll have to get some back when we're in Wisconsin after Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, no, when I started to do it for mine, I haven't finished. It was really emotional. Yeah. Um, I was looking through all my training logs and I was looking at days. Mm-hmm. I looked at the day I got my dog and like Aww. what I wrote and like the day I met my partner and like all these things. And it's, yeah. it was quite emotional to yeah. look back on. I could see that being really, really emotional of just like going back and thinking of like looking at training that I was doing like before Foot Locker or something in high school of just like, thinking of like how different of a person you are and like how how training is so different how goals are so different and stuff like that or like yeah I think there's something cool about like looking at like oh yeah what was my training on the day that like I watched the like when I watched Abby Diagostino at the like Wisconsin invite when I was in high school and skipped school to go watch a cross country race. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But like, yeah, stuff like that where it's like the kind of things that like built you and inspired you over the course of that. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
So we're, we're going to wrap it up, but you just spoke mm-hmm. to that. Like you're not motivated with running to think about, okay, like reaching a certain amount of miles per life. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like is motivating you right now? Ooh, I feel like the motivating aspect is this idea of growth. I think I've been really constricted for a really long time of thinking of this as like a very short term thing. And like, especially with like, just thinking of my body as something that's like, oh, like it's in the process of breaking down and I have to get it all while I can because this doesn't last forever. And trying to think about this motivating aspect of like, man, like I'm finally in a spot where I'm like feeling really healthy and good. And I can see every, like every month things getting a little bit better and a little bit stronger. My body's moving better and I'm actually like healing and growing. And so thinking of that, of like, rather than like, man, I'm 29, I'm so old. Thinking of like, man, I'm only 29. Like I got time to like keep growing and doing this and just seeing like where this goes and being really excited for obviously the challenges of this next chapter, but like what, where it could also lead. I think that's the fun aspect of it. It was like, I have no idea what this is going to be. And I think for the first time, that's exciting rather than scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming back to a word we spoke to earlier, there's just so much like self-discovery. Yeah. Discovery that's ahead for you right now. Yeah. I think that's it is like finally feeling like I'm like, like happy with the person that I'm becoming and excited to see what that's going to be and know that it's going to be different than what it has been. And to be okay with that mm-hmm. awesome yeah. i'm really excited for you molly good mm-hmm. luck with chicago mm-hmm. and i can't wait to get to talk about it next month thanks jules and yeah. good luck to your marathon too this is so fun <laughs> love you friend love you too <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to our second episode of The Build Up, a Beyond the Pines production. If you have a guess for Molly's lifetime miles, share the podcast and your estimate on Instagram and tag her in it. Stay tuned once a month for a new episode from now until February 2024 as we continue to document Molly's mental and physical preparation for the 2024 Olympic Trials Marathon. A huge thanks to Matt Shapiro for photography and videography and John Summerford for music and audio production. You can also watch the live recording of the buildup on Molly or Beyond the Pines' YouTube channels. Tune back in in October. Be well until then.